Um, hello, everybody. Um, so welcome to the fourth webinar in a series of webinars on teaching at the right level. Um, many of you will be very familiar with the format from previous webinars, um, but for those of you who are new, uh, this is the fourth webinar in a seven-part series which looks at key components of Pratham's pioneered teaching approach. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, today's webinar um, will be focused on teacher training, and we are lucky to have Radhika Bula, who's a senior policy associate at JPL Global, talking about some of the evidence on teacher training. We also have Usha Rain, who is the director of content and training at Pratham, and Mira Tendulkar, who is the head of math content at Pratham, who will be presenting for us today. Um, we, before we dive into those pre presentations, let's just go over some of the kind of house rules for today's webinar. So the presentations will last um, approximately 40 minutes, and after the presentations, we'll have time for questions. So thank you very much to those of you who submitted questions in advance. Um, from this list of questions, we have selected some questions for a Q&A session at the end. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, you'll notice that you are all on mute, so please pop them into the chat box um, and we'll take a look at those too um, and direct them to the presenters if we have enough time during the Q&A session. Um, so with that, I think let's dive into the presentation with um, Radhika, who will present on evidence on the effectiveness of teacher training programs. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Okay. So to get us started, I'm going to just share some statistics that I think most of, most of us are likely familiar with. Um, we, there's been universal primary enrollment, but children don't seem to be mastering basic skills despite attending school. Over 80% of second graders in Malawi, India, and Ghana could not read a simple word, and over 60% of second graders in India, Uganda, Ghana, and Nicaragua were not able to com complete a simple two-digit subtraction problem. So these low levels of learning that we're seeing around the world could be linked to a variety of different factors, things like low school quality, student motivation, parent motivation, um, and then today's topic, of course, things like teacher performance and teacher effectiveness. And it might seem obvious, you see on the screen, I've written that teachers are crucial for student learning. Um, but it's, I think it's interesting to think about how important teachers are in the student learning process. So we have simple statistical associations, so just basic correlations from Sub-Saharan Africa, which show positive relationships between teacher preparation and student performance. But of course, there are many other factors that we're not necessarily uh, controlling for that could be at play there. But there's additional research which corroborates this, this relationship um, from the United States, which shows that the difference between a weak teacher and a great teacher amounts to about a full year of learning for students. And then we have additional suggestive evidence from RCTs that teacher quality is important for student learning. So we have a handful of studies um, conducted in a, a number of different contexts which show that incentivizing teachers to exert more effort, maybe that means attending school more, maybe it means teaching uh, more when they're in school, um, perhaps by tying bonuses to student test scores. These examples tell a pretty consistent story that when teacher, teachers are exerting effort, when they're um, having the tools to, to teach effectively, that students are learning more. And so this attention, um, on teacher effectiveness is sort of paid in a couple of different ways. We might think about training um, in the pre-service format, so before teachers are actually in the classroom when they're getting certified. And then we may also have in-service training, so professional development training as teachers are in the classroom um, working with children. So today we're going to focus on the body of research um, that we have from just in-service or professional development training. And as there's been more and more focus on not only getting more kids into school, but making sure that they're actually learning and mastering basic skills, a large amount of time and resources is spent on trying to improve teacher performance and effectiveness. So about 80% of education budgets are spent on teacher salaries. And a survey that was cited in the World Development Report um, from 2018 showed that 91% of teachers from 38 developed and developing countries reported attending a professional development training in the past year. 
And then additionally, of about 171 World Bank projects that had an education component, at least two-thirds of them included some type of teacher training. So there's a lot of focus and attention in a number of different ways on how to equip teachers with the tools that they need to teach more effectively. But other than some of these suggestive evidence that I uh, pointed to earlier on the importance of, of teachers, um, we have limited evidence from RCTs on what makes a great teacher and how to help teachers be more effective in the classroom. So today I'm just going to share with you um, some of the findings that we have as well as some um, high-level conclusions that we can come to. So we're going to start by talking about evidence from the North American context, and then we'll move um, to research from developing countries. So we'll start with some of the North American evidence, as I mentioned, and a recent review of education studies conducted in the United States um, by Roland Fryer, who is a J. Paul affiliate and an economics professor at Harvard, um, found fairly mixed results from in-service or professional development training for teachers. So he starts out this review by classifying professional development in two categories. He considers general professional development, um, which focuses on things like classroom management or increasing teacher knowledge. But as the name suggests, general professional development is, is fairly flexible in nature. So one example that he cites is a program called Classroom Assessment for Student Learning, which provides teachers with a textbook, a DVD, an implementation handbook, and it's meant to be self-directed or self-executed by the teacher themselves. And the idea behind this classroom assessment for student learning is that teachers are going to use the training materials to understand how to conduct formative assessments of how their students are doing, and then to use that to tailor their instruction to help students who might need um, more attention in certain areas. The program is intended to be implemented by teacher learning teams where teachers can get together um, and discuss what they're learning and get feedback from each other uh, who are also using the program. And what researchers found from this program is that teacher knowledge of how to conduct assessments did increase, but that teachers were not incorporating how to use formative assessments into their classroom practices. And so in this example, we didn't see any change in uh, math test scores. And in fact, of the three general professional development programs that were reviewed um, in this uh, education review, actually none of them improved student learning, even though in two examples, teacher knowledge and classroom practices improved. So there seems to be something that was lost in translation between teachers understanding how to use the training materials, even potentially changing what they were doing in the classroom, but that subsequently didn't actually lead to uh, improvements in learning. The second type of uh, category that is cited in this review by Roland Fryer um, is this idea of managed professional development, uh, which is much more prescriptive in nature than general professional development. And these programs tend to prescribe really specific methodologies and detailed instructions on how to implement them. They also provide continuous follow-up support for teachers as uh, teachers are implementing the prescribed methodology. So one program that was cited in this review is called Success for All, which is a school-wide program that's helped teachers identify and address learning gaps for primary school-age children. And the goal is to help students reach third grade on time, having acquired basic skills, which they can then build upon in later grades. And Success for All is sort of a comprehensive package that schools are able to purchase and includes things like uh, materials for teachers, training, ongoing support for teachers, and then a really detailed blueprint of how to deliver and then sustain the model. And teachers who are part of the Success for All model receive training on a variety of different instruction methods, and each school is also designated a program facilitator from the Success for All team. Teachers initially start with three days of training at the start of the school year, and then 16 days of follow-up support throughout the first year of implementation. After the first year, teachers continue to receive about 15 days of training per year going forward. And this first example of managed professional development improved reading across a, across a variety of different measures after three years of uh, implementing the program. The second managed professional development program is called Reading Recovery, which aims to help first graders who are struggling to uh, catch up to their peers. It's a shorter program than Success for All is. Um, students meet with a specially trained teacher for about 30 minutes every day for 12 to 20 weeks. 
These specially trained teachers are not necessarily the classroom teachers. They're often assigned to schools and they receive year-long trainings at special training facilities as well as at the schools that they're assigned to work in. During these trainings, teachers are learning how to design and deliver lesson plans and also how to collect and use data on student progress. Um, and as with the Success for All program, this managed professional development program also led to large improvements in reading ability for students. And actually, given the results of the research, uh, reading recovery was then scaled up to over 2,000 schools in the U.S. So it was effective and also uh, seemingly a scalable program. So those are a handful of examples that we have from the U.S. context. We see that general professional development programs, which are more flexible, have not always had the expected impact on classroom practices or on student learning. However, managed professional development programs might be more promising, but of course this is only based on about seven evaluations that I've told you about, and so we can't necessarily draw strong conclusions based on those alone. And interestingly, the 2018 World Development Report, which focused on education, included a whole section on teacher training. And one of the background papers for the report, um, the citation is on the slide, um, looked at a large body of evidence from both rigorous quantitative studies as well as qualitative research from high-income countries. And when they took this body of evidence together, uh, some of them were also the programs that I mentioned to you, they came up with a few key recommendations for effective teacher training. So the recommendations from the report suggest that teacher training is effective at improving student learning if the training is embedded in the curriculum. Um, it prescribes a specific pedagogical method for teachers to use, including detailed instructions on how to implement it. Um, if teacher training includes a lot of follow-up support um, or monitoring for teachers, and that it involves teachers in a co-learning model. So as I mentioned, the studies that I talked about earlier and these recommendations are mainly based on evidence from developed countries. So next I want to turn to how we can think about uh, research from uh, developing countries, specifically from India and the Philippines. So this first program is called Continuous and Comprehensive Engagement, and it was implemented through the government of Haryana. And this CCE framework replaced high-stakes year-end exams with more frequent evaluation of student performance across academic outcomes as well as non-academic dimensions. And the idea behind this continuous and comprehensive engagement program was that by allowing teachers to monitor student progress at regular intervals, teachers could customize their lessons based on students' current learning levels. The hope was also to reduce pressure on students by giving them several opportunities to demonstrate their skills and improve their performance as opposed to having one high stakes exam at the end of the year. And the government of Haryana trained teachers uh, who were teaching grades one through eight to implement this continuous and comprehensive engagement program. However, when you look at the monitoring data from the program, it seems that teachers didn't actually apply this methodology in the classroom. And not only did they not apply it, it seems that they, even though they attended the training, they may not have actually fully understood what they were supposed to do or how to go about incorporating this framework into their teaching. Um, perhaps it was complicated, perhaps they were unfamiliar with it, um, but kind of whatever that reason, they weren't using it, and perhaps unsurprisingly, we didn't see any improvements in test scores. So I'm going to spend now the next few minutes talking about a series of evaluations that JPL affiliated professors partnered with Bretham to conduct. And a handful of previous proof of concept evaluations have, had already showed that the pedagogical idea behind Bretham's teaching at the right level approach was effective at improving test scores. But to reach larger numbers of children and to take TARL to scale, um, JPL affiliated professors evaluated different iterations of teaching at the right level when Bretham was able to implement their program through state governments. And as you may have seen, a lot of these training programs have a lot of different components, and it can be difficult sometimes to sort of tease out which of those might be driving the effects that we see. And TARL itself also has various components. It has this interactive pedagogical materials um, that have been developed by Bretham. There's the teacher, teacher training component, and then there's also the additional monitoring and volunteer support that teachers often receive. So researchers and Bretham wanted to test the effectiveness of each of these different components. 
So there was one program, it's not on the slide here, but one program where um, teachers were given just pedagogical materials um, and weren't given any additional uh, information on how to use them or, or additional support. And what that example found is that teachers did not regroup students during the day and there were subsequently no improvements in learning. However, even when teachers were provided with these pedagogical materials, as well as training on how to use these in two states in India, in Bihar and Uttarakhand, students still did not learn more. And similar to the example that I just mentioned, where teachers were only given materials, teachers didn't actually regroup students during the day and implement the teaching at the right level approach. And one possible reason that training teachers wasn't enough in this example is that perhaps teachers needed additional support and monitoring to change the status quo of teaching in the schools. So while teachers had the materials um, and teaching at the right level is a fairly straightforward approach that they were receiving training on, actually implementing it requires a much larger change than teachers might be able to implement on their own. So they have to reorganize students by level during the school day. And that might take something more than um, simply providing training. So then in the Indian state of Haryana, Bretton partnered with the state government to implement teaching at the right level during the school day. And in this example, teachers were allocated a dedicated hour in which to implement the teaching at the right level approach. And existing government monitors received extensive training on the approach who were then providing support to teachers. So these government monitors received about four days of training and, and additional days of practice in the field, in schools, to test out the Pratham methodology for themselves. And in this instance, in contrast to the Bihar and Uttarakhand examples, we see that teachers did in fact reorganize children by level during the dedicated hour and student learning improved. And at JPEL, we're in the process of conducting a review about 120 evaluations that are all trying to improve learning outcomes, uh, some of them by integrating different innovations into the school, into schools. And when we look across a number of these programs, one important component that we seem to see across effective programs is this idea of ongoing monitoring and mentoring even after teachers receive an initial training on the program. So this example that I just talked about from Haryana provides some further suggestive evidence of this, um, as does one additional program um, of a readathon program in the Philippines. So this month-long readathon provided level-appropriate storybooks and then trained teachers on how to engage children in daily activities. Uh, so things like storytelling, uh, literacy games, silent reading, um, those sorts of things. And the implementing NGO, SAS, also provided monitoring for teachers to make sure that the program was being implemented, implemented as expected, and then to also support teachers, answer their questions, and help them incorporate uh, the new books into the curriculum. And in this example, we see that higher, uh, that fourth graders who were in the, in the group that attended the readathon program, they had higher scores in reading than those students who didn't receive any kind of readathon program. And three months later, after the program had ended, we see that students were still reading more. But what's interesting is that once the program ended, the implementing organization, SAS, was no longer providing direct support to teachers. And when you dig into some of um, the monitoring data, it looks like the evidence shows that teachers implemented this new curriculum less often after the program ended, partly because they were no longer receiving additional support um, from the implementing organization. And subsequently, we see that the gains in reading had diminished slightly after teachers were not implementing it as often. So in taking this kind of limited evidence that we have from both developed and developing countries, um, there seems to be at least a few conclusions that we can start to come to. So first, we know that there are large amounts of time and energy and resources that are going towards teacher training, but we lack strong evidence um, that in-service training or professional development will increase student achievement from both developed and developing countries. However, when we're thinking about this concept of managed professional development programs from the United States that I shared, as well as the successful TARL examples from India, um, as well as this Redefine program in the Philippines, we start to see that perhaps training teachers on specific pedagogies, uh, as well as providing ongoing monitoring, may hold more promise. 
But again, these takeaways are based on a small number of studies, um, and we need more research to really understand what effective teacher training looks like. Uh, so that's everything that I had. Um, I think we'll hear from uh, Usha and Mira now. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was, that was great. So Usha and Mira are going to talk about practice-oriented approach to, teaching, to teacher training. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I will present a case about uh, teacher's training and uh, training of Pratham uh, full-time um, um, uh, staff, uh, how we train them and how their training translates into action. So let us start with the presentation. Next step. Next step. Um, the whole focus of uh, teaching at the right level is uh, that uh, um, we should focus on issue of children's learning as opposed to only schooling. So uh, children are promoted in higher grades, but they don't acquire basic reading and math skills. So um, normally what we observe with school teachers either or people who work with us directly, that they are aware that this is the situation and children are not learning. Either they are not they have acquired basic reading and math skills. So um, when we deal, they are aware of the situation. So when we start dealing with these adults, so these school teachers or um, their trainers or the whom they are going to give training as master trainers or resource persons, first principle that we follow and uh, we try to understand that it is the adult learning that happens in during training programs. Okay, so a group of trainers train training and both the uh, people are adults. So understand first that uh, master trainers, resource persons or school teachers are adults and one must respect their knowledge, their experience and their wisdom. So whatever training we are going to impart to them needs to be designed in such a way that they are not just at the receiving end and they also can contribute to the kind of inputs that, that they are going to get from us. And, and the second point is about learning by doing. Uh, the whole process of training is never dependent and based or focused on only giving lectures and uh, having dialogues with people. They are supposed to participate in the activities and those activities are demonstrated and then we do acquire the knowledge of practical know-how. So this is learning by doing. So they are supposed to then, during training, they, they, we expect them to work with children and see what exactly is their level and accordingly how to work with the children. Thirdly, the whole delivery of this training is very simple, doable, and they sh it is activity-based. They should feel that um, they can participate and um, they are part of this whole training process and they are not just passive listeners. So this is another very important principle we follow. The, um, another important thing that we focus on um, telling the uh, participants that you must have faith in children's capacity, that uh, they children come up with their own knowledge set and they too know certain things and it's not that um, we they are just merely recipients. Then um, uh, without creating any commotion or um, we must have a faith in their capacity to have discussion. So giving free hand to the children is really very important and then your the person who is dealing with the children should be um, should believe that they can handle independently certain things and they can do certain things independently with discipline. Um, they can acquire knowledge with inquiry, curiosity, they ask lots of questions and they show enthusiasm. So uh, having faith in all children uh, in children's capacities is very, very important. The next important uh, principle we follow is the mode of facilitation. 
we never call the trainer as teacher or uh, the person who is giving knowledge to children or the people who are going to get training from the trainers you know you are uh, the person's role should be of a facilitator and the way we try to define facilitator is that that help children or help the people to learn and don't teach them so it is very important for us to the word learning so sometimes we wonder and sometimes we say that prl should be lrl learning at the right level and uh, what we also see that uh, don't give ready made answers to the children or even to the adult learner and just have patience and perseverance by showing confidence in them that they can come up with uh, their own answers then um, uh, the another important principle is that uh, they must understand implications of evidence so each time the evidence is built it is not only just based on the data or testing or assessment just based on your observations you can promote children from one level to another so if but evidence needs to be there you know children if children are at the very basic level of reading such as beginner level or later level and within this couple of days if you see there is a good improvement in child acquisition then child can be promoted in other level and that evidence is uh, needs to be the person should acquire that ability to see evidently that there is some kind of improvement in child's performance this is a process of learning together to uh, with, with adopting appropriate instructional method and creating teaching learning material none of the training that pratham conducts we give, we, we give a ready made set of teaching learning material uh, the participants are encouraged to create their own set of materials like uh, uh, pratham makes them create their own reading material or the material related to mathematics so then um, people who participate in this training feel that they own the program so ownership is very important once you uh, make people uh, do certain things independently then they also feel that they can be a part of this whole process can you go to the next slide please yeah the um first program that is uh, being implemented by pratham is called kamal which is almost equivalent to trl kamal is combined activities for maximize learning so it is all the activities are brought together so it is not just children uh, because the you know, training when it happens at uh, different levels it can turn into it turns into cascading and the cascading has uh, dilution um, danger so the process simple we try to involve everybody in each and every activity so that people don't tend to forget things over a period of time so, uh, so what kamal believes in uh, here are some six um, approaches that we um, uh, think that kamal um, focuses on this that children learn in many ways and um, so uh, you know stimulate their different uh, sensory systems like listening uh, speaking seeing they can adopt knowledge so it is not that some children can cannot read but they can they can be effective listeners or some children can just read and they can't focus on listening so bringing all the sensory systems together and making children children work with those activities is very important and integral part of kamal then uh, um, while listening is we make every child to listen speak do read and write and all these five components play very important role so uh, an activity uh, is uh, uh, all the activities are designed in such a way that children uh, they listen they speak they do those activities they read and they write i will give some uh, elaborate examples later but we will uh, go to the further point these activities are combined as per children's levels 
so children if children are at beginner level or just uh, below number recognition level so all the activities are brought together all these components are brought together and we believe that though the children are not reading we encourage them to read very simple text we know that they are unable to read anything but they are given confidence that they can read and by road sometimes in the initial phase they start reading and then subsequently they can start making meaning out of whatever they are reading the chunk of those words and um, another very important thing uh, uh, that is that all the activities are conducted either in school class or in group activities or individually so this process is followed very very uh, systematically so certain instructions are given to all the children together and they are made to sit into the smaller groups by their level and then subsequently those who just cannot make it um some children the little older children or the facilitator helps individually those children who are very seriously lagging behind then every child is made to write something daily so either they write some gibberish on the notebook but they are encouraged to write and they are encouraged to um express their own thoughts uh, and nobody pays any attention in the initial phase about how grammatically right spelling they are writing but they are encouraged to write those uh, text next next slide please uh in india when we work with school teachers we uh, uh, with our own people we divide the training um, uh, part into three three parts first is a preparatory phase second is national training and third is state level training so there is kind of a cascading that happens in our model next slide please in the preparatory phase uh, a team of uh, national master trainers they all sit together and these are four topics that we dis have discussion about is first we determine expected outcome then we design the training plan we design session plan and we create material so uh, in while det determining expected outcomes we learn um, how to deliver how to expect from the master trainers and what what we should ex we should be expecting from stage resource group and then we uh, just have discussion about pratham principle of training and define profi profile of each stage based on the baseline and end line of the previous year while designing training plan we we define a mode of delivery how we should be training then we distribute responsibility who will be de doing what and material development also simultaneously is discussed then daily training if the training is planned for 10 days or 15 days what activities will be conducted why they need to be conducted and how will they be conducted when will they be conducted every um, minute to minute uh, plan is created content of the activity is created and mode of delivery of facilitation also is defined properly which is delivered to all the master trainers material creation is very key and important uh, portion in uh, preparatory phase where uh, we review existing material if required we create new modules or new material next slide please i will talk about the um, teacher training first this is about the pratham uh, appointed instructor we uh, uh, conduct training on two two level one is on the national level on another is on uh, another is on the state level on national level we um, uh, call all the uh, state re we call them state resource team and the people from the language and mathematics comes together on the national level and these are the people who had uh, more experience working in the field uh most of them uh, uh work with pratham for many years and so uh, it is not like giving them only a um, training about the kamal but also we talk about and we share a more experience what they had in the 
field. So all states come together. So it they get opportunity to work together, exchange their ideas together, you know, and talk about more uh, using uh, um, some theoretical aspects of the Kamal, how and why we are doing Kamal like this. So you know, so it is like giving them a additional input about what is the Kamal and what is the pedagogical principles related to the Kamal that we actually give in a uh, training. Other than this, we also give them input about the um, how data to look. We have a, a separate team to do a monitoring, measurement and evaluation. The team which also uh, create the small data mock um, uh, situations for them and the people who participate, the trainers, uh, trainees who participate in that training, we give them opportunity to talk about more about data. And after that, once they get all these things, they sit by uh, state by state to do the planning of their own training. Uh, on the state level training, they conduct training for the Pratham instructors. And these are the paid staff of Pratham State resource group, uh, group conduct training for this instructor. Some of them, every year we get some newly appointed instructor. So we have to conduct training thoroughly for each and everything, like uh, how to mobilize um, uh, uh, the students in the villages, how to talk to the school teachers, how will you talk to the parents, how will you conduct um, assessment in the field, how will you interpret? How will you, you will do a grouping according to the um, data? And, uh, of course, uh, that is about the, uh, everything. Um, uh, will you go for the next slide, please? Yeah. And in government partnership, uh, here there are the different levels. Like for government partner, partnership, we as a master trainer from the central. Uh, national level we come together to for which uh, state we are going to do a training what kind of objectives should be there and the master trainer conduct training for the uh, government master trainers who will uh, deliver this training for their teachers on the ground level and uh, this is how we go normally uh, for us uh, in our case we conduct training for 10 to 15 days, but in government side, we don't have luxury to conduct the training for 10 to 15 days. So it comes up, up to win one week or uh, along with their own agenda. So for mathematics and language, sometimes we get only two to days. So um, on the basis of this, we ask them, we insist them that you have to conduct a practice class for um, at least for 15 to 20 days, and then after we ask them to conduct the training of their teachers. So here, first, Pratham's person was very important to when they conduct training for master trainers of teachers, government teachers. And then after, their role get a um, little lower, but the master trainers role uh, get more and more effective because they are supposed to give training to their teachers. And the topics we cover under is that, what, about that is what is CRL, like Kamal, why to conduct practice class because that is more important because teachers uh, most of the time they they say that we don't want to conduct a practice class so this is a very important thing why trainers can monitor the classroom effectively why basic skills like reading and arithmetic need to be ensured because they always say that they have to work many things in the uh, school so we have to emphasize on the reading and uh, arithmetic basic skills and we also talk about discussion and practice like assessment, activities, label-wise distribution of children and why it is important and creating reading and math material. That That is the more thing, that most important thing which we, which we always do when we conduct teachers training. Uh, next slide, slide please. Yeah. Um, so I will discuss here in just few with uh, just few slides about what do we do in reading and arithmetic. So um, as you all must have, must have been knowing about the levels of the children, so determine first uh, what are the levels of the children, and um, uh, then based on those levels, how to deliver activities. 
then uh, about uh, numbers uh, what are the level uh, children are distributed um, then um, we all know children are familiar with the print but uh, then uh, help them to acquire reading skill build their confidence help them to listen carefully and speak without inhibition encourage them to participate in activities and the guidance with demonstration to work with them and then learn independently to read so this is uh, in reading and arithmetic next next slide please um learning by doing is uh, applied even for uh, for the children so they are not just again passive listeners and they are supposed to uh, get engaged in different activities such as mind map think about the words talk about the words write those words and sentences do do loud reading and do independent mind reading then solving mathematics uh, mathematical sums uh, so by solving mathematical sums we make sure that they should, they are talking loudly about each step and then while solving the word problems first they have discussion about the word problem then uh, with the help of material they follow steps and understand logic both um, arithmetic logic uh, and the numeric logic of the solving of mathematical sums so all the activities as i discussed before listening speaking doing reading and writing are brought together in each and every activity so if one has to work with the children the person who is going to work with the children either a teacher or the person who is going to train to the school teacher needs to be equipped with each and every of these steps with information they learn that um, uh, what children learn is that while reading they must move their fingers under each word uh, and this uh, demonstration school teachers needs to give to the children or the volunteer needs to give to the children because normally uh, putting a finger under each word is not practiced in all the schools but if you need to draw children's attention to a very minute uh, space of uh, um, uh, words then their attention needs to be drawn to that um the aspects of these you know understanding numbers place values and follow rules of solving operations all these aspects are done together we finish our presentation now thank you thank you very very much isha nira um great so we've got some time now for for questions so the first question will be directed at Mira and Usha. And the question is, what are the biggest challenges to successfully train teachers and master trainers? Uh, I will try to give a lecture. For when we conduct training for master trainers uh, um, and teachers, so basically there is a big difference. That government teachers, when they come, uh, they are most experienced people. they know how to teach children so if we go there and start teaching them something they will not like it so when we conduct training for teachers we always say that we are sharing our experience what we did in our field and that we are going to share with you and another thing is we talk about that we are not going to talk about the everything what they are teaching in their school we are just focusing on the basic skills of reading and arithmetic so and before before going uh, giving them uh, about the whole uh, training we just start getting some ideas from them also because they have for they are actually in the government teachers training we actually i, I will not say we are wasting time but many things they want to say about their their issues their problems you know so it is necessary first to listen them that is how we start teacher training and in master trainer training we actually have to do a dual uh, we we actually face a dual responsibility like the master trainers yes they are good in their um, uh, basic skills but sometimes we also think that we have we have to give them a knowledge how you you have a knowledge about how to 
tall um, sum but how to explain it to the children or how to tackle with children that is the most important thing we do with the uh, master trainer that these are the two basic challenges we face and uh, while we conduct training okay thank you so the second question is for Usha um and it is is there a pushback from teachers when government approaches and teaching at the right level approaches differ? And if so, how is this overcome? Uh, will you please repeat your question again? For sure. So is there a pushback from teachers when government approaches and teaching at the right level approaches are different? And if there is pushback from teachers, um, how do you overcome this in the training? Yes, there is. There are. There are those. Uh, we face those issues when um, government approach is different than uh, teaching at the right level approach. So, uh, because you know, it is because they are adults and they have been doing whatever they have been doing as teachers in their schools. So they get quite used to it. So uh, you know, under the circumstances, uh, unlearning becomes really a major issue because they are used to doing something. And uh, it is quite obvious that if somebody, even somebody comes and tells me, you know, you do your work in this way and not in this way, then probably I also may not like it. But uh, um, this, you know, making them understand what exactly is teaching at the right level is uh, very, very important. So what helps actually and triggers their interest is assessment, you know. And uh, as uh, as they all know that kids are lagging behind and they are not reading, but the moment you get into actual testing and making them understand the levels of children, then they know what exactly does that mean. Okay. So uh, when they distribute reading by five levels, so initially they may be saying that oh these kids are reading and these kids are not reading, but now they know for sure that okay. These number of children are absolutely at beginner level, and couple of them are can just recognize few levels. That really helps them to understand. So assessment really plays major role. And uh, yeah, there are initial initial problems, and there are initial oppositions from teachers, teachers unions. But then subsequently we overcome all those because. Uh, assessment can really play wonders, and then they understand why this needs to be done. And it is not just uh, you know uh, what teaching at the right level does. Teaching at the right level, what it does mainly and importantly, that um, it doesn't just show you the mirror and saying that okay your kids are at these 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 levels. What TRL does is that that the moment you tell them that this is the situation. Immediately, it is supported by the um, the treatment. Okay, so both assessment and treatment goes hand in hand, and um, this doesn't just become it doesn't just become a research activity. So, other than research, it really gives helping hand to school teachers. Okay, now you know that these kids are lagging behind. So, what are you going to do about it? Let's try this, and then. The activity starts. Uh, the the discussion on activity starts. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Isha. Um, so, Raj, this is a question for you. Uh, what does Adam say about duration, frequency, and profile of trainers? Great. Um, so, I think when we look at the body of at least RTT evidence, um, I don't know that we have direct evaluations that are asking these questions of duration and frequency and who the trainers are. Uh, but I think we can think about maybe some of the recommendations that came out of the World Development Report, um, which looked at both quantitative research as well as qualitative research studies. Um, and these seem to find that one-off workshops, like a one-time training, were less effective and that trainings that were embedded in the curriculum, so they were within schools so that teachers could um, get feedback on how they were doing um, kind of on an ongoing basis so that they could raise concerns specific to their teaching curriculum. That kind of ongoing component uh, seemed to be one of the key recommendations that came out of the World Development Report. 
And I think that feeds into some of the um, RCT evidence that we talked about today based on um, the teaching at the right level evaluations, which showed that simply providing training um, kind of one time wasn't necessarily enough to change um, and give teachers everything that they needed to be able to implement the teaching at the right level uh, program. But that being said, I don't know if we can necessarily put like a set number of days that a training should take place. Some of the early teaching at the right level evaluations that we didn't necessarily talk about today had trainings that lasted from four to six days and up to two weeks. And the length didn't seem to change the effectiveness of the program, but other components um, like field practice for teachers as well as ongoing monitoring for teachers did seem to play a role in um, uh, whether or not the, the teaching at the right level was improving learning. Um, and then on this question of the profile of trainers, I, I really don't have too much information on that. I think none of the evaluations really looked at who these trainers were, um, comparing something like a cascade model to something else. Um, but I think one point to consider when thinking about training teachers um, is that it's kind of similar to this whole conversation we've been having today about teacher performance and how to help, help teachers be more effective for student learning. Um, in the same way, who the trainer is and how they're conveying information is really important to make sure that the teacher is gaining the skills that they need. And so it's possible that there are lessons from like adult education that could apply here, um, but I don't have kind of specific evidence from RCTs that look at that question. Great, okay, thanks so much, Radhika. Um, okay, next question, um, Mira, would be great to get your thoughts on. Um, and the question is, how do you maintain quality of training as more and more teachers are trained? So as teaching at the right level programs scale, how do you maintain the quality of the training? Yeah, this is actually a big concern that when we go on mass scale, uh, the, it's a question of how to maintain that quality of training. So uh, what uh, Usha said earlier, our more, more focus is on giving them a practical know -how. So when, uh, and we, we don't talk about the many things at a time. So in the reading and arithmetic, if they understand, if they um, ag get agree that yes, there is a problem that children should understand, should know a basic reading and arithmetic skill, so their focus should be very, very focused uh, program it, it should be. And when we, so that is how we ask, when we do more and more teacher training, our focus is only on the giving them a demonstration and doing a more practice. So that is how we are thinking about. Uh, in the, in the, this is in both the case, in government as well as in the uh, Pratham side, it is a cascading model because when we conduct training through master trainers and it is going on the field with just some other person which is uh, conducting that training. So there are the possibilities of losing some something in that in between that. But what we are trying to see that they should understand what is the baseline and what should be the end line. So if they understand it, here the quality we are trying to keep or uh, maintain on this basis of the when they do assessment very well, when they understand what is the assessment and why it is important, along with the, all the activities. Thanks. Uh, Radhika, is there anything from the evidence about how to maintain quality at teacher training scale up? Yeah, so again, I don't know that there is necessarily like a, this direct question um, uh, that's been asked about taking a program to scale and how to maintain the quality. But I think from some of the teaching at the right level examples, um, there's some kind of key components that seem to play a role. Um, so I think one thing we, we seem to know is that training alone is not necessarily enough to change teacher behavior. Um, and so kind of including that in the program, in the training, making sure that teachers have the support that they need, um, that they're provided with field practice, um, that trainers are able to you know, demonstrate activities and explain what they're doing and why they're doing it um, for their own understanding, but also to help um, the teachers that they're training really understand it. Um, and then providing this ongoing support like refresher trainings and in-classroom mentoring. And so I think there could be a lot of different ways of maintaining qualities of training, uh, quality of training as they're um, taken to, programs are taken to scale, but I think kind of some of the key components are maintaining some of these um, factors that seem to be really important for um, improving student learning. Um, 
Great. So maybe just one last question. Um, so this is a question about um, the transferability of the effective teacher training. Um, so this is a question for Usha and Mira. And I think what the question is asking is, if you train um, some teachers in a particular school, but not all of the teachers, do you think that those teachers being trained has an effect on the other teachers in the school who may not have directly been trained, but are now working in the same school as the teachers who were trained? So Usha and Nira, do you have any um, kind of thoughts or experiences on, on whether that's the case? Because the, uh, the the teacher who is already trained and a PAR in methodology, uh, and if they practice very seriously uh, the method in their own classrooms, that teacher can become a model teacher, or the for her class becomes a model class within the school premises. So, so in uh, most of the cases, wherever uh, such uh, models we have created. Uh, the, this person, this teacher becomes a resource person for other other teachers also, and uh, that is really helpful in uh, especially in the locations where cluster resource coordinator is unable to visit very frequently all the schools over a period of time. So creating and if the schools are at distances, different uh, far away from each other, then creating one model classroom in one school becomes really very crucial important. And this person can become a good resource person. This is number one. Number two, uh, when uh, such a person is created for each school, uh, for, uh, such a resource person is created for each school, um, while imparting training to uh, especially government teachers, what we uh, have understood uh, is that, that uh, there is a there is a method in place and there is a framework. But uh, we don't say that this has to be done, you know. This H A S T O B E should not be in capital. You know, we give lots of flexibility to those individuals who work with these children. Because uh, sometimes when they uh, distribute children in different levels, they take help of other school teachers. And then they tell uh, other school teachers that, okay, I will handle non-readers and you please work with children who are at simple paragraph and uh, story level, okay? So these um, uh, kind of um, adjustments school teachers make during school hours if the classes are to be conducted within school hours. So uh, it is quite an effective thing if for each and every school we create one model teacher, and she takes up the responsibility of uh, teaching at the right level. Um, okay, fantastic. So thank you very much to the presenters and all of you that listened in today. Um, and we hope that you'll tune in for the next webinar, which will be on adapting teaching at the right level for different contexts. And we will circulate more um, details on that soon. Um, thank you very much. Bye-bye.